What's up? How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody excited? You're an enthusiastic bunch this morning. Hey, so does anybody uh, get dry this time of year? Like my hands are always dry this time of year. I don't ever use lotion. Does anybody here not use lotion? Thank you, Riley. So yeah, yeah, just need a little healing. That's the only not fun part about this time of year is I get, my hands get real dry and I don't like it. And I'm not a lotion guy. So when I shake your hand, it feels like you're shaking hands with a lizard. So just ignore it if I sandpaper your hand whenever I shake it, all right? Well, I'm excited you're here. It's gonna be a good day. Anybody ready to hear something good this morning? Well, um, if you will, Let's just close our eyes and let's just welcome him. Uh, we've already been in that state of worship, but let's just thank him. I want you to just thank him, if you will, just whatever he's doing in your life. And, and we just want to welcome his presence here. Father, thank you once again for all that you do for us. We're so blessed and so thankful to have such a great church family, be able to come together, enjoy. We just thank you that the spirit of peace and unity is the, is the heartbeat of this house. And just ask that you would just continue to, to connect us to you not to a denomination, not to a church building, not to a group, but to, to you and the body of Christ. So we thank you for that. And I just pray that you'd keep us in a state of, of, of constantly seeing who you say that we are and not who we, who we hear that the world thinks that we are. And so I just pray this this morning, God, and ask for your guidance and your wisdom today as we open your word. We thank you for today in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Romans chapter 8, we're in a series, continue changing the subject, specifically talking about the three-day or what happened after the resurrection, what took place when he rose. Um, you know, did Jesus just go to heaven and be like, hey, it's over, let's just hang out? Or what was he doing? Because uh, we started off the process with him saying, remember Mary, he said, Mary, don't cling to me yet because I've not yet ascended to my father, meaning that he wasn't finished when he, when he, when he appeared, him, appeared to the people, appeared to the disciples and those. Uh, he wasn't finished with the work. He went to heaven and we learned that the last week that with the blood, his blood, he cleansed all the heavenlies. He cleansed the altar in heaven. So now that, that coldly purified everything about heaven because we know that the devil had access to it. And Joe will read that he presented himself before God. And then we find out with Jesus and the Beth, burial and resurrection that, uh, Satan was cast out of heaven, no longer has access to accuse you before God. And so, We've now discovered that we are cleansed, right? We are purified. We are washed in the blood. See, when you sing about the blood, it's not just a song or a phrase. It's actually the reality that we have been cleansed. Look at your neighbor and say, you are clean because of the blood. Isn't that good? Hey, really quick, does anybody here, uh, uh, is anybody here not good at sharing? You can point at your spouse if you want to. That's okay. Well, um, we have any um, spoiled kids or, I mean, firstborn? Are you firstborns, spoiled ones? No, I'm just kidding. Well, I was a secondborn, so my sister was born before me. And uh, um, my sister was kind of funny about when she was little, so she would play with her toys. Uh, and so when a kid would come over, because it was just her, um, they would come over and she would get all of her toys and try to hold all that she could, right? And then they would go over and play with another toy. She would drop those and run over and try to get that toy before, you know, because as a kid, you're growing up, you're like, what are you doing touching my stuff? You know, as a kid, it's yours. It's, it's, it's all. Does anybody here have that, that kind of issue today? So um, we have actual footage. Uh, it's audio footage because, you know, we were born in the 80s. And so it's audio footage of my sister and I. How many used to have a, the tape players that were like this? And you hit the button, it would pop it open. You put it in there and you could you'd record yourself and stuff. Well, my sister and I, we had that. That was our entertainment. And so we would record ourselves. And in this instance, we were singing. I think Amber was singing Harper Valley PTA. You remember that song? Yeah. So she was singing that song. I, on the other hand, was wanting to sing the theme of Batman. And so uh, we were little. She was probably maybe five. I was probably three. Well, we had this deal because she's firstborn. She would not share with me, you know, because I ruined her utopia of just probably having everything, you know, when I came on the scene. And so we were having to learn to share. And uh, so she was like, and we had this on tape. We can't find the tape, but I wish we could. I would have played it for you because it's a really interesting because I lose it in this tape. And Amber's trying to calm me down. She's like, go ahead. You could sing. And, I, and, she, and I'm wanting to hold it. 
to sing into it. And she's like, it can hear you. So she is telling me this over and over in this recording. It can hear you, Josh. And I'm starting to ramp up the emotions. I'm like, <laughs> and, and you can hear me trying to talk and get emotional at the same time. And I, so I'm trying to sing Batman. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Batman, that was what I was singing. But I just wanted to hold it. She wouldn't let me. I'm, I'm so thankful she's delivered of that. And now I at least get to hold things when I go to her house. So I'm just kidding. No, she's, a, she's, a, we, we had to learn to share. That's, you know, everybody goes through that as kids, right? Learning to share. Well, I brought all that to say this is, you know, when you get into the kingdom of God, what's amazing is that, is that Jesus, you know, can, can I say this first though? Uh, the reason why we struggle with sharing is because we fear we're going to run out. The reason why that, you know, a kid doesn't want to share is because it's like, I don't want you to have this because it's mine. I don't know what to do if you take it. You know, how many of you don't like to share food? You buy your own and you put it and if anybody touches it, you like lose your marbles and, you know, you want to kick them out of the family, right? So I, I know some of you out there. Uh, and, and what's interesting is why, why do I fear that? Because I don't want to run out. If you eat them all, then I don't get to have one when I want one six months from now. You know what I mean? And so what happens to us is we fear running out. Well, let me just say this about the kingdom of God is that you never have to fear that you are going to run out of anything. And what does that mean? Because Jesus gave us something when he raised from the dead and he ascended to the Father and he did what he did. Not only did he just raise, there was something that, that happened in that moment. Look, hit your neighbor and say, an inheritance. Romans chapter eight, look at verse 16. We're gonna read 16 and 17. It says, the spirit himself bears witness that our, with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, we kind of read through that. That's an important verse. Why? Because the spirit of God in you is bearing witness. It is trying to witness to you and tell you that you are children of God. We wanna not claim it. We wanna kind of distance ourselves because maybe our behavior, but he is trying to, to witness to us saying, you are the child of God. You are a child of, of your father, okay? Verse 17, and if you're children, then you're heirs, heirs of God and a joint heir with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified. Now, how many knows uh, that Jesus received an inheritance as a son? And because we are connected faith-wise through him and his work, we have become a joint heir with him. That means whatever he received, we receive as well as a, as a joint heir. Doesn't mean you receive part, because that's not how it works. In our, in our world, we half it. Like you get some of it and you get the other half. In the kingdom of God, you get exactly everything that he has. He didn't say, okay, I got the good stuff. I'm gonna give you just a little bit of it. He give you everything that he accomplished. Everything that was given to him, he gave to us. Now, how many knows how a will and testament works? So a will and testament, when someone signs a will or a covenant or a testament, which is what we call the New Testament, it's new covenant, what that is saying is that this, that whenever I pass on, I authorize that the person that, that I designate, that they receive everything that I, that I have worked for or earned or whatever was mine, I now give to them, okay? Right, everybody, everybody cool with that? We, we believe that, that's how it works? Well, then here's the thing. Understand this, that, that everything that that person has, the one that wrote the will in the, te in the Testament, um, all of that was accumulated by his efforts, right? How many of you have ever gotten inheritance? Did you, did you work for all that money? Did you work for that? Or did you just happen to be connected to and be put into the will and the covenant of this person and whatever they did, now they said, hey, I'm gonna give that to you now. You may have been a turkey, their whole life. And they still were like, hey, you know what? I'm passing this on to you. Now remember this, you can't earn it. It's given as a gift, right? So it's an inheritance, why? Because you didn't earn it, it was given to you as a gift. Now I want you to keep this in mind because what Jesus has given us is not something that you can earn, it's something that is gifted to you. All right, so keep that in mind. Let's go to Revelation chapter one. We're gonna read about four verses here. So what did his inheritance or what did Jesus receive that he has given to us? Revelation one, verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. If you read this whole little part of this, it's just it's stinking amazing. But I'm just gonna read this part. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. So that's one thing that he, he obtained in his inheritance was he has the keys 
of hell and death. How, how many of you ever had kids that when you got out of the car, they would lock the doors and think it's really super funny that they did it, right? So my girls would do the same thing. We'd get out of the car. I'd get out of the car and I'd be doing something. And they would like lock the door and they would just, they were laughing. They were already laughing. I haven't done anything. And I would, I, it was locked. They're like, oh, you know. And they didn't understand that I had the keys in my hand. So as much as they tried to act like they could keep me out of there, how many knows when you have the keys, there's nothing that can stop you? So what the enemy will try to do in this instance will tell you that you do not have access into the presence of God because of who you are, all this stuff. And what, is, what Jesus is saying, I have the keys to hell. I have the keys to everything that would keep you trapped. I have now the access. I am the authority that unlocked it all. And now nothing can keep you from the presence of God. So know this about it, that nothing can keep you out of his presence except your own mind believing that he does not want you in his presence. There's no distance between you and him other than your mind saying that there is a distance between you and him, okay? So that's the first thing he did. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Here's the second one. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven and whatever you loose, declare unlawful on earth, must be what is already loose in heaven. So now, charismatics, we took this verse to mean this. We're just running around binding and loosing everything, meaning that we have to, it's like spiritual warfare stuff. You know, if we're having a hard time, we just bind the devil. That's not really what the context of what he's saying is. He's saying, remember that I'm already gonna defeat the enemy. Because remember, this is, he's talking beforehand, but now after Christ has done what he's done, you gotta bring all of that into the new reality. So he's saying this, what you will now be able to do by inheritance and the keys that I give you is you will be able to declare for your own self what is lawful and what is not lawful for your life. Meaning this, you'll be able to say, you know what, that sickness is not lawful in my life. I don't give it permission. Why? Because heaven already declared that it has no ability to hold us captive. You see what I'm saying? And now I can, able, so I can forbid it or I can permit it. And he said, that's what I'm giving you as an inheritance. So this, watch this. So when things come on our life, whatever's going on in the world, stuff happens, right? But this is the interesting thing. I now have the authority by Jesus given to me. And I'll show you the next verse here in a minute to say, you know what? I don't allow that to stay in my life. I don't allow for that to be a part of my world. Why? Because he gave me the keys to give permission or not permission to be in my life. Now, that doesn't mean you just walk around cutting people out of your life because you just don't like the way they, where they breathe, that kind of stuff, okay? What that means is what heaven has declared that is finished, I now have the right to declare that within my own life and to believe that for myself, okay? That's just a couple. Here's the next one. Watch this. Go to the next verse, if you will. I believe it's uh, Philippians. And being found in the appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And verse 11 says, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Now watch this. What does this mean to us? That means that Jesus has been given all authority. He's been given the name, the only name that is higher than any name. So that every name that's ever named or can be named has to now submit itself to his authority. All right? This is your big brother. This is your co-joint heir in Christ. This is what he obtained through his obedience is he obtained authority to have the name which is above all names. And how many said this? He said, you can ask in my name and I'll do it. Did he not? So now he says this, by the authority given to me, whatever name pushes itself against you, the name of sickness, the name of debt, the name of, of frustration, depression, he said, now all of those names have to yield themselves to my name. That's part of your inheritance. Okay, here's one more. Go to 2 Peter chapter one. This is the one that's gonna really be a blessing to you. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, when we read this, we gotta read this because sometimes we read through that and we'll just read it really fast and think that's like their modern day saying, hey, what's going on, guys? I hope you're all doing well. That's not what he's saying. He actually says this, that grace and peace would multiply to you according to your knowledge of God or knowing him and of knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said, grace and peace, I pray that it will multiply to you as you know God the Father and you know what his son is and who he is. 
as his divine power has given to us. Come on, how many knows that in English that means it's already taken place? I don't know much about English, but I know that that's past tense. It's already been given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowing him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, you and I may partake of the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this, let me just break that down for you. If that's a lot of reading, you're like, what? What that means is this. He says, I want grace and peace to multiply to your life. So much and so much. He said, how's that gonna take place? He said, first of all, because through my power, through what I did, I give you the, 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 the ability to have all things that pertain to life and godliness. To be more like him, I've already given it to you. To have whatever you need on this earth, I've already authorized it for you to have it. He said, now, then he shows us how that's gonna happen because I've given you exceedingly great. Like I could have just said, I mean, he could have just literally said, I've given this to you, to you through promises that I've made. He didn't do that. He just, he amplified it and says, these aren't just promises. These are exceedingly great and they're precious promises. And through these, we can partake of the nature of God or the reality of God here in this earth. Are you guys booming yet? Like I say, boom a lot. And so, so these are moments, I think amen, uh, boom is the new amen. You know, it's like, boom. You know, that means, oh, come, come on, it's good. That's like a bomb drop. And so what he's trying to tell us here is this is your inheritance. Is, is we're not sitting here feebly defeated by everything that comes our direction and circumstances. He actually says, I've equipped you to overcome whatever reality that is coming your way. Not because you and I are better than any situation, but he is better than any situation. And he has prepared for us every single thing that we need to have in order to overcome that. Whatever your challenge you're facing right now, there is a promise that exceeds great that you can grab a hold of and by the authority of Jesus, it becomes the reality for you. Boom. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Amen. Boom. I love it. Isn't that so good? Exceedingly great and precious promises. Now listen, these are generalities. He's kind of throwing these generalities, all things. Now this is what's funny, is he didn't just say, it would have been better if he would have said, hey, when your family's acting crazy and they're all not serving God, you can trust that I'm gonna bring them back home. It'd been great if he'd have said it, but all he said was this, between these promises, all things that you need, I've made a promise for it. So it's generalities. But the more I know him and the more I commune with him, he gets really specific or I get really specific about what I need and what I'm walking through and what I'm asking him for. Let's take, let's take our land process, for example. It's interesting because I discovered some things after the fact. So we were, we've been believing God for the property, you know, we're just telling you about it. And then remember, how many of us remember what they've been telling us? what they say? They're never gonna sell, never. We've already asked people, been trying to buy it for years, never gonna sell. This is what's amazing. So we're like, okay, well, all right. God's bigger than that. And so we just made them know we're interested in the land. Let me think about it. You know, how many knows that you say that whenever you're not really interested, right? Hey, would you like to tell me? Oh, let me think about it. You want to come to my party? Let me think about it. What you're saying is no, but I don't want to tell you face to face. I'll text you that I can't make it. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, you guys don't act like you're honest and be like, oh no, I'm good. No, we're like, oh man, let me think about it. And then you're like, well, I can't go because I'm sitting here doing nothing, right? So what's interesting is is he said, you know, this is the promises you can have. So, so the land is, it's like, okay, well, he's not gonna do it. So we just kept saying, okay, God, you know, you can open the door, you can shut doors. We just put it in your hands. How many of those he opened the door? All that happened, we were able to purchase the property. Here's the crazy thing. We close, we have a conversation with a guy that was selling it. He comes to us and says this, hey, hey, listen, you know, when you guys, or when we had Marty made our deal, someone came up to me afterwards and tried to buy it out from under you. Shame, shame, shame. No, I'm just kidding. But watch this. Watch this. Now watch this. How, how many knows this? I don't know if, if he knows the Lord. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But how many knows most in the world that if I have this much money and someone comes along and offers me this much money, how many of you are like, all right, see you? Because right, right, how many knows contracts mean nothing to people anymore? Very easily said, hey, you know what? I'll take this more. But he answered this way. 
No, I've already made the deal. Now, now, see, we're like, oh, what a great guy. Listen, can I tell you this had nothing really to do with him? Had to do with somebody else because we already had a deal with him. And our deal with him was this. Lord, we're believing for this and we pray that you're gonna open the door. And guess what? He opened the door. And guess what the enemy tried to do? He tried to shut the door. But guess what God did? <clears throat> Can't do that. Why? Because I've authorized them to have that. It's their inheritance. Now let me ask you, what, you what if he would have done it? Hey, would there have been more land and he would have opened another door for us? But see, so what happens is the enemy tries to get us hung up on a situation, but that was a specific thing that God did for us specifically. So my question is, have you asked him specifically to do something for you? Let me tell you this, his answer in Christ Jesus to all the promises are what? Yes. yes. That would have been a good boom too right there if it had put boom in the Bible. All the promises to you are boom. I think that would work because you know, Dunamis is the power of God and it's like dynamite and it's for dynamo, so it's like a boom. Come on, I'm telling you, we're rewriting this dude. Romans chapter four. Now, why is that the case? I'm not just saying that to randomly throw it out there to say why he was doing that, because he made a promise. We felt a promise, we believed. He said, if we ask anything, he would do according to the, to the will and the, prop, and the plan of God. Now watch this, Romans chapter four. Look at verse number 16 when you get there. Here we go, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. It's according to our trusting him so that it could be according to grace, meaning grace, remember, is this. It's God's ability to do something that we can't do. So it says, it's, I need you to trust me because I'm gonna have to do this according to my own abilities, not yours, right? And he says, it's according to grace so that the promise might be sure, here we go, to all those who are not only of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The promise might be sure. That word means guaranteed. He said, I'm trying to show you and me that the promises that I make to you are guaranteed. Why? Because you operate in them by faith in what Jesus did in his efforts. Basically this is part of your inheritance. He accomplished it through his grace, through his ability and he now, by faith, gives it to us when we trust in the work of Jesus. That make sense? So how do we know it's sure? Okay, this is where I want to get to. So I gave you all that to let you know you got an inheritance. Whatever the case may be, whatever you're walking through, whatever you need, there's a promise and there's a purpose for it. And there's a plan to get you there every single time. So how do we know or how is it sure to us? Go to Hebrews 9. We're going to dive back into Hebrews I'm going to take this bull by the horns this morning. It's a country saying. Hebrews 9, look at verse 13. He says this, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies or sets apart for the purifying of the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot, to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Remember, he cleansed your conscience from dead works or works that we do in order to get God to do something. Remember this, your behavior, your actions, your stuff that we do does not determine whether or not God blesses you. Faith determines that. You cannot do things to get God to respond to you. If we do, it's considered a dead work. If I try to be good so he'll do something for me, then he's given me something based on my works. He will not do that. Why? Because he is a God of faith and grace. All right? So he's trying to show us there, I'm cleansing your conscience from dead works. It works to try to be right with me, to try to earn what I am giving you as an inheritance. And for this reason, he is the mediator or the intercessor or the go-between or the reconciler of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who were called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now watch this. He says this. He's the mediator of the New Testament or the new covenant. And he said, and the reason he does this is watch. This is interesting. He did it. He offered himself by means of death. And he did that for the redemption of the transgressions, for our sins, our missing the mark, that were because of the first covenant. Because of the law, Jesus came as a mediator of a new covenant and he died so that he could redeem us from the mistakes of the first one, meaning this, you need to keep this, 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 and this, right? That those who are called might receive the promise of eternal 
inheritance. What's that mean? Eternal inheritance means not when you get to heaven. Eternal means perpetual. It means always giving. It never runs out. It continues to go. So whenever you were born again, you entered into eternal life. That means this, you're never going to not exist anymore. When you fall asleep in this life, you'll awake in your next. Does that make sense? You're eternal with him because of that decision. Now, here's the interesting. He's the mediator. Now, remember this word. He's our go-between. He's the one that intercedes for us. That means he's the one that is, is, speaks on our behalf, for lack of better words. Go to Hebrews 7. Here we go. I'm, just, I'm making a point here. Verse 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety or a guarantee of a better covenant. He's the guarantee. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Let me pause here really quick and kind of explain this. So he is writing this book to the Hebrews or the people of God that always have been under the old covenant and the priesthood, okay? So he's explaining some things about this. He was saying to them in verse 23, they've always had new priests, but they, they couldn't continue forever because they would die because they got old, right? So he's telling them in verse, that's what's going on. They were prevented from, by death from continuing, verse 24. But he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. It means it's never going to change. He is the only hot priest anymore, all right? Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. That means completely, without, it's forever done. He is able to save forever or completely those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for us. Let me pause because the word intercession, we're like, whatever does that mean? The word intercession is a Greek word that's a compound word and it means to hit the mark. And it uses the picture of an archer shooting an arrow. So we say in this, Jesus lives so that he can always hit the mark for you and me. Just, just let that sink in. You know what causes us so much pain in our life? Missing the mark. And he said that his job is to do this is to hit the mark on our behalf. Why? Because he hit the mark once and for all time. And he said, here it is. This is all yours now. All this is yours. Now in our life, if we missed the mark, we thought now we got all this bad stuff coming. Jesus is like, hey, you missed the mark. Get back up because I've already hit it. And believe that what I did when I hit the mark is now yours. Does that make sense? Boom. <laughs> Because why? Because most of the time it's based on our performance. The cleansing of our conscience, uh, we cleanse our conscience by, well, you know what I'm gonna do? Is I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna be better at this and then that's gonna, God's gonna do something. Let me tell you this, you're already gonna receive the resistance from God, why? Because you're not under grace, you're actually under your works. So sometimes the resistance you feel is not necessarily the enemy, it's God's, it's God's grace that you're resisting. Think about that. Why? Because I'm trying to do what he has already done. And it doesn't work. It's like butting heads because it's, it's, I'm trying to get something done. I'm trying to be better. And God's like, I've already made you better. Trust in what I did. Believe who you are. Believe what I say about you. And watch that come to pass. The thing he said, what happens to us is that we want things to be fulfilled in our own season. So we'll go our own direction to try to fulfill them. Like it'd have been easy just to go out and borrow a bunch of money and then go buy land, right? Wouldn't that have been easier? Think about it. It's easy, right? Just go borrow the money. You can get it anytime you want. But what happens is now you got a sorrow added to it because you got the weight of that coming at you every single month. Are you with me so far? Why? Just because I wanted it now. Come on, your neighbor and say, that's really good. I know you're just like, oh my God, oh my God. Now listen, if you, if bar, if you bar, don't, that's not, that's not what this is saying. What I'm trying to tell you is that, is that in the kingdom of God, he has provision for everything, right? I have truck payment, all that stuff. So it's not like, oh my God, what do you do? That's not what that means, Okay. It's about that he has everything planned, but oftentimes we try to go on our own efforts to bring it about. And, and all we have to do is, is patiently endure to see his promise fulfilled, right? Okay, now I'm gonna show you some things because this is how it works. Now his sacrifice was not about changing God's mind about us, right? 
This is what we think. We think that when Jesus sacrificed, he now stands up there interceding between us and God. And God's like, I'm just mad, but I love you, son. You know, that kind of a deal. And then he's like, I love, but listen, it wasn't about changing God's mind. Why? Because God loved us while we were still yet sinners. It was about changing our mind towards him. Whose thinking is off, mine or his? Well, yours, preacher, right? Yeah, why? Because my mind says he doesn't want me around. But we'll say, no, that's what God thinks is he doesn't want me around. That's not what it ever says. It says we create ourselves as enemies of God in our own mind. So we push away. And he didn't, wasn't changing God's mind about us. He was changing our minds about our access to come boldly into the very presence of God. Why? He was showing us, Josh, you can come into the very presence of God and stand face to face with him. Here's the problem. We don't like face to face. Right? Come on. We don't like, it's, I, we love a go-between. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We like that. Go to, go to Hebrews 7, really quick. Hebrews 7. So why do we need him? Let me read you a couple more verses. Verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under, the, under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest who would rise according to the order of Melchizedek? Now, if you don't know who Melchizedek is, you gotta go back to Genesis when Abraham went and rescued Lot and they plundered, uh, they got all the riches back from that group that, that took his, his family. And the priest came out under the order of Melchizedek. Now, remember, there was not there was not, according to anything written, there was not a priesthood set up yet under the law. That was under Aaron, Moses' brother. That's where the Levitical priesthood came in. So we have this priest walking out named Melchizedek, and, and he was the king of Salem, which is all these connections are saying, that's Jesus is who this is. And so Abraham met him, and he offered tithes, and he, and he was blessed and all this. So that's what he's saying. So now Jesus has arise, risen again as a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron in the Old Testament law. Are you guys with me so far? So he's saying this. If perfection or completeness or us being right were through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there be for another priest that should come? Right, so that's kind of what he's letting us know. Look at verse 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change in the law. So he's saying now you no longer have the same law that governed your life. You have the law of God's love, loving God and loving each other. Those are the two laws that govern our lives. Does that mean the Old Testament law is done? Nope, because not lying to people means that you love God and you love others. Does not commit into adultery means you love God and that you love others. You see what I'm saying? So it's all wrapped up under that same nail. Now, Jesus is the mediator or the high priest over this new covenant. Now, why do we need like a go-between? Because face-to-face -face gets real personal to us, right? So every denomination that exists since the beginning has created a mediators between us and God. A lot of times we like to rough up the Catholic church because they have a priesthood set up that is in alignment with the old covenant, where you go and you talk to the priest, he prays. You know, I know during COVID, I think the Pope said, now you can actually pray to God yourself if you want to. Okay, but it's interesting. But now it's, but, but there was a priesthood. Why? Because there's a mediator between them and God, right? And so us charismatics are like, yeah, we don't do that kind of stuff, but we do the exact same things. Why? Because we have people that have special anointings. Ooh, they got, a, they got an anointing to hear from God. Or, and, and so, you know, I've got something that I can give you. Can I tell you this? They don't have anything they can give you. He's the one that's given everything. That's right. They are just a conduit to share his love. They are not special. Nobody is special in that sense that you have something that's not from him. That means anything. But that's a mediator. If I pray for you, man, you'll get it. Let me tell you this. That's a mediator. That's someone that's trying to be a go-between between you and him. Jesus wanted to be, God wanted to be face-to-face -face with us. Not you come to me. The other denominations, they exalt their pastor. Well, you know what? I don't know how to pray, so I'm gonna have him go pray. Can I tell you this? That's not what God wants. You can have somebody pray with you. There's nothing wrong with that. But what he wants is he wants to talk directly to you. Boom. 
Let me say this. You can talk to God. Well, I don't know how to talk to him. Talk to him just like you talk to me. If you were to come to me and say, hey, Josh, you know what? I need you to pray for me because I'm going through this. Man, it is brutal. It is hard. I don't know what to do. Take those words and tell him the same thing. Because I can tell you this, he's listening. And all you got to do is calm yourself to say, you know what? God, what do you say? And I promise you in this book, there's a promise that will walk you through and out of whatever turmoil and difficulty you're facing. That's how good he is. So I remember, I don't like face to face, right? That's just my deal. I remember when I was like in junior, I was, I think I was a sophomore in high school. So here's an interesting story. I'm gonna kind of throw it out there and you guys will be like, you're a dork. So I remember um, I had, I kind of had a girlfriend kind of deal going on and, and, you know, baseball season was going on, you know, and I was kind of like, I don't think I didn't want a girlfriend anymore. And so I was still under the Old Testament law of um, have somebody else talk to them for you, right? And let them know that you don't want to date anymore because I got other stuff going on. But I, I didn't get too impersonal because I wrote a note explaining everything, all right? This person was older than me, okay? Yeah, they were older than me. So I remember we had a game that day. So I was like, okay, whew, it's over. Whew, got that done, you know, because I was all stressed out about it. So anyway, I had a trusted person that was friends with both that would carry out this message sending, okay? And so I, you know, we didn't have text, so I couldn't text. You know, you guys just break up through text or snap. You're like, it's over, you know, and do that kind of stuff. But, but we, had to, we had to write notes and send it by carrier to the person. So anyway... So anyway, I was under, remember, I'm, I'm from middle school. I just got out of middle school a couple years before. I'm still under like a, you know, I tell them we're breaking up, you know, that kind of deal. So anyway, so long story short, the game's over. We're leaving. Here comes the person that I sent the note to. Beelining towards me. I can't go anywhere. I don't want to face to face this sucker. They walk up to me and this is what they say. Hey, such and such, which was the note carrier, said, you had something you wanted to tell me, but they lost the note. <laughs> Hit your neighbor and say, liar. Just gonna let you know right now, big lie. And I was like, my tongue went down my throat. I him hawed around, you know, I almost wanted to say, oh, nothing, you know, I'm in love. You know, I just wanted to just, we'll deal with this another day. But I girded myself up and said it. And there's some like some tears. I was like, oh my God, this is stupid. Why? Because it's hurting my heart. You can't cry. You're supposed to be mad and walk off and throw something at me on the way. You know what I mean? But I was like, oh my God. What? That's why we don't want face to face because it's personal and it's real and it's gross because it's, how I many of those loving people is not easy? Because it didn't just work the way you want it. Because if it worked the way you wanted it, you'd be loving yourself. <laughs> right? And so you're not loving yourself, you're loving someone else, which means I have to strip myself of who I am. So what God is saying this, Josh, listen, I want you to just come to me just like you are. And I want you to talk to me and I want you to share with me what is on your heart and I want, you to, I want you to know that this is who you are so that you can believe me for what it is that you need. I'd rather you ask him. Why? Because I'm afraid that he may say no. God has never said no according to his promise. Ever. Why? Because Jesus is the surety of that inheritance that was given to you and me. Hebrews chapter 10. When I was in Arkansas, here's something spiritual that was kind of taking place. This was, you know, charismatic church. I was in this group, you know, and I was struggling pastor and didn't know what I was doing really. So I'm just, I'm trying to figure anything. I'm trying to get connected. Anybody I know that knows what's going on. So I, you know, our church has had like eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 people. And my family was half of them, you know, and they can't quit because I won't talk to them if they do. So, you know, it's all this stuff going on. And, and, and I was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know why the church is not changing or growing. What's going on? So I'm connecting to all these guys. They're like, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got So I'm doing all those things and nothing else is working. Even to the point that one time there was this thing where it's like a big emphasis on spiritual sons. I don't know if you guys ever heard anything about this, but the reason why it's not going well in your life, Josh, because you need a spiritual father. 
Makes sense to me. Why? Because if you don't have a father, then you don't have an inheritance. Oh, that makes total sense. Can I tell you? Total manipulation of scripture. Why? Because it's a mediator between me and the father. Saying that, Josh, you can't have this unless you've got this person in your life that says, yes, you now can have that. You see how easy we can get back into the Old Testament? Why do you write Hebrews? Because they kept going back saying, we need a priest. And then writers like, listen, you have a priest. His name is Jesus. The problem is, is that he is not saying, tell me what your problem is. And I'll tell him, he's saying, you through me can talk directly to him by the authority and the access that I've given you. That's why it says you can walk into the very throne room of God and talk to him boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy to help and grace to help in your time of need. When is that time of need? Before the sin or before the problem? In the middle of the problem? After the problem? The entirety. Anytime you need, it's available. One more thing. Here we go. Hebrews 10. You guys okay? Verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So here's the triple A of the new covenant. He says, boldness to enter. You have access, right? By the blood of Jesus, you're authorized to enter that place. You know, when I was in the uh, Padres organization, the minor leagues, I had access into, I had authorization to be in the building to be in the club, but I didn't have access to every single thing there. But Jesus is saying this, listen, there's not things that I'm holding back where you can't, I'm telling you, you have authorization and you have access because of the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. The veil, Jesus, He is trying to tell us that I am not the person you talk to to go do this. I am the veil through which you enter into the very presence of God. His flesh gave us access into the presence of God. Remember he said this, there's gonna come a time where you no longer ask me, but you'll ask the Father in my name. It means you can walk into the presence of God through Jesus and that authorizes you because of his name, what he has done to ask the Father and it be done for us. That's so good. I'm like, holy smokes. But this is a new and living way. So the other triple part of the A is the abundant life. Here's what the word abundant means. When he said, I came to give life and you have it more abundantly, here's what the word means. More than necessary, over and above, super added, superior, extraordinary. The new and living way is through Jesus into an abundant life, a newness of life, which is a life of abundance. Well, I just don't need that much. Yeah, but check it out. There's other people that need some and God may use you to be a blessing to them. Well, I don't need anybody but my family. Can I tell you this? No, you need more than that. Why? Because you need them and they need you. Why? Because God is gonna use you to share his love with those around you. The reason why we don't is because we're afraid we may get hurt and it may not work out good. But let me tell you this. Remember, he's always there. Here's what the last part it says in verse 23 in Hebrews 10. Look at verse number 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That's it. He promised, and he is faithful to that promise. So I want you to think about this. I want you to go and stand to your feet. We're going to pray really quick. I hear a lot of pastors, pastor friends of mine. I listen to them talk and I can so relate to them because I hear them talk about their life and I hear them talk about all the stuff they're walking through. And I think about it a lot because I did the exact same thing. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, is, is for some, somewhere along the line, the pastors have now became the mediator between the church and, and God. And it has gotten so out of order. I listen to these guys just wore out. They don't want to do it anymore. You know why they don't want to do it anymore? Because they're carrying people's problems. That's not their problem. Why? Because it's easy for me to say, I need you to take care of my problem. Instead of saying, 
God, I need you to take care of my problem. Because what we want is we want somebody to fix it. But remember, it's about face to face. And that's what we've, not, we've tried not to do here is not connect anybody to anything other than him. Nobody in this room has an answer that will change any situation in my life unless it's come from the alignment of God's word. There's no special anointing that's gonna fix it, no special prayer that's gonna fix it or that's gonna change anything. It's just the simple fact of me connecting to the Father and the Father releasing all that goodness, all those things that he said I already am through my heart, convincing and persuading my heart that what God has promised, it is mine and it is yours. Does that make sense? So maybe you've struggled with being face-to-face to God. I want you to just close your eyes, if you will. Okay, here's, here, here's what I want you to do. This is gonna be a little weird, but remember, God gave us his, our imagination. He gave us our imagination because he gave that so that we can build pictures that would create emotions to us, that would connect us to the reality. You ever remember reading books, and we talked about this in group, about reading a book, and then you go and watch the movie, and you're so disappointed with the movie because they did not do what your mind did. Why? Because you created it according to what is, it leans into your life and speaks to you. And so what he's trying to say this about your imagination is you have the ability to connect and it create all these emotions that help solidify the faith that we have. So what I want you to do this morning is simply just close your eyes and I want you to fix your eyes on him. Whatever you think he looks like, just fix your eyes on him. If you don't know what he looks like, you don't even know how to think about it, just think about there's pictures that talks about his hair is like, like white wool and it's just so white and pure. Just think about that. His feet were like brass. His eyes were like fire. Just, just get that picture. That's a little scary sounding, but just get that picture. That's what kind of might our God is. And let me tell you, that same might of that picture of how awesome he is, he leans down to the apostle John and says this, fear not. That same God with all that power and might and authority touches his son and says, hey, don't be afraid. I'm on your side. I'm walking with you. And I want you to get that picture of him. And I want you to get the picture of him. And as you get that picture of him, I want you to see the inheritance that he's laid out for you. That means this, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you have walked through and that is so challenging or so difficult, I want you to see yourself walking out of it in Christ. See him carrying all the weight of that in himself. Like a sponge absorbing water, him absorbing all the hurt and the pain that come from that situation that has held you captive and that him bearing that. And what you are receiving in return is life. The breath of God, the peace of God. It's like if someone would have handed you a million dollars and you were able to take it and pay off everything for all time and you had an endless supply to never have to worry about any of that ever again. That's the peace that comes from being connected to the kingdom of God and and the love of Jesus. I want you to just let that And I want you to remind yourself this morning that he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. Father, I just ask right now over this entire group that whatever it is, the challenges that we face, those that feel overburdened, those that have felt disconnected because of whatever the fears are that have told them that they do not belong in the kingdom of God. They do not belong in the presence of God There's too much rough edges or too much uh, a past there. Lord, I pray today that that would be consumed in their mind by the image of the cross as you bore that sin. Not only you bore it, but you died because of it and that you rose overcoming all death, hell, and the grave and that you possess all the keys to life, godliness, freedom, healing, deliverance, peace, joy, reconciliation, all that is born in your, and we now have access to walk in it. And I thank you for that restoration this morning. I thank you for the peace of God. Hey, if you're struggling right now, just receive the peace of God right now. Just accept it. Come on, he loves you. You're at peace because of the blood of Jesus. You now have peace with God. He's not resisting you. He's not pushing against you. 
He's actually open armed, welcoming you into his presence, into a new and living way. Father, I thank you that it would be solidified in the hearts and minds of every one of us. I pray that if we have struggled talking to you, that today that fear would be lifted to be able to be open and honest and talk to you the way that we would talk to our dearest friend and that you would do it without judgment, you do it without rejection and the answer and the promise will be sure to each one that asks. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And we thank you for that this morning. Let all the promises of God to us be yes this morning. And we thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, come on, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Come on up here, Jesse. I love you guys so much. What I want you to do is I want you to take what we talked about. Remember this, anytime you come to church, what I want you to do is I want you to take what, what we talk about and I want you to take it and find out how it applies to your life individually. Don't just take a message and be like, okay, that was, that was interesting. Okay, let's go on. I'll see you next week. I want you to take what it is because it doesn't do any good if I don't take it and make it applicable to what I'm walking through. You may be like, well, how do I make an inheritance applicable? The same way we just talked about. Whatever you're facing, you have a promise. It says you have all things pertaining to life and godliness. There's a promise. I go grab a hold of that promise. There's all kinds of concordances out there that tell you, hey, if you're looking for this, look at these verses. If you're looking for this, look at these verses. And you just grab a hold of a verse. Stand on it. I promise you God will speak to your heart and show you the direction for it. So, amen. Love you. Go ahead, Jesse. So, uh, let me tell y'all a funny story, a 